ago, we entered the season of Lent, a time for reconciliation, reflection, and renewal. We began with seven candles burning, but have journeyed with Jesus toward the cross, and the light has dimmed. Now, on Easter morning, we celebrate the end of this journey and the beginning of another, a new journey of transformation. We relight the candles to symbolize the transformation of darkness into light and of death into life. Okay, Marie, light the first. As we have journeyed together, we have embraced and celebrated God's presence in our lives. We have tested God's promises and affirm that God is faithful. We have been renewed by time spent in stillness and reflection. We have surrendered our sins to God to be remembered no more. We have been reconciled to each other and united in community. We have committed ourselves anew to follow the path of Jesus. And we have been transformed by the light of the living Christ. Let us pray together. God of transformation, we have have traveled traveled through through the darkness darkness of Lent Lent and and into the light of Easter morning. Now we set out on a new journey, one that will lead us beyond the cross and into the world we are called to serve. Shine your light upon our path, God, and fill us with new life. Amen.
When the Bible stories started, they were told as stories from generation to generation and passed down. So at this moment, if you have your Bible open, I invite you to close it and to listen to the Word of God. On Thursday, we heard that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with His disciples and He told them to love one another. On Friday, Jesus went to trial, was convicted, and was crucified on a cross. And He died. This morning's Gospel reading from Mark 16, verses 1-8 through 8, picks up three days later. So listen to this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, who will roll away for us the stone from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very heavy, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But the young man, he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid Him. But go and tell His disciples and Peter that He is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see Him just as He told you. The women went out and fled the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Past the betrayal of Monday, Thursday, through the condemning crowds and the crucifixion on Good Friday, into the silence of the tomb on Saturday, to this bright Sunday morning where once again all things have been made new. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Or at least that's what we're told in Mark's Gospel today. Unlike the other three Gospels, Mark's Gospel ends with no resurrection sighting, only an angel in an empty tomb pointing the way to Galilee to three terrified and amazed women. For most scholars believe this is the authentic ending of the Gospel of Mark at verse 8. That Mark ended his gospel with the terrorized and amazed women saying nothing. We hear that Jesus has been raised, that He is not here, that He has gone ahead, and we will see Him in Galilee. But through the eyes of the women, we do not see Jesus, only an alarming young man. And we do not hear the witness of the women, only their silent amazement and terror. Those three women showed up at the tomb in the midst of personal chaos. Their expectations had been completely dashed. They expected to arrive at the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, a body that would have started to stink after three days in the tomb. 
They expected that this was another failure, another letdown in their lives, another covenant broken, another promise left unfulfilled. They expected that they knew the end of the story, that death had the final word. Our witnessing women lived between the Friday and the Sunday, between witnessing the crucifixion and witnessing the resurrection. With those expectations in in place, it's easy to understand why they were struck dumb by terror and amazement. We live in a Friday and Saturday world where it is easy to say nothing to anyone about our risen Lord, where it is easy to resign ourselves to the things that always will be the same way. We live in a broken and beautiful world, in a broken and beautiful church that is in need of a resurrection. When we look at the brokenhearted in Garissa and Germany, when we look at the hungry kids in our own neighborhood, when we look at the dark and stormy skies, it is easy to think it will always be this way. It is easy to expect death instead of life, failure instead of triumph. Our world thinks that they know the end of the story. But from the moment that the woman heard the news from the angel that he has been raised, that he is not here, their lives were no longer the same. Terror and amazement seized them. Excitement ran through their arms. The hope that bubbled up in their heart must have poured out as they fled the tomb. For although Mark ends his Gospel by saying that the women said nothing, their witness must have happened because we are here today. They must have overcome their terror and proclaimed the good news that He is risen. He is risen indeed. They must have run and gone to tell the disciples and Peter to meet Jesus in Galilee. And they must have seen Jesus once more, all because of the surprise of an empty tomb. One of the great meetings of the Easter eggs that we hide every year is the surprise inside the tomb. I watched our young people open their Easter eggs yesterday, yelping at each surprise, a piece of candy, a penny, a nickel, and some other fun Easter treats. And in that spirit, I have an Easter egg for everyone here this morning to pick up on the way out. Like the women who entered the tomb, you will get a surprise message in each egg. There is an Easter word in each egg for you. And throughout the season of Easter, which goes for 50 days, I invite you to pray on that word and whatever it brings up in your life. I hope that through this practice, you will get a glimpse of our risen Lord, that you will find a glimpse of resurrection in your life. We, like the three women, see, we live in the light of the resurrection. We are an Easter people, a Sunday people. And that's not to say that life for us is always easy and bright but that even in our grief, even in the storms, even in the shadows of Friday, we can hope to see Jesus. We can hope to witness a resurrection miracle. For resurrection isn't just about receiving eternal life. It isn't just about what happens after we die. Resurrection is also about how we live today expecting to see the image of Christ in the people we meet. Resurrection looks like an addict in recovery, taking it one day at a time. Resurrection looks like a broken heart finding love again. Resurrection looks like a long-lost daughter finally calling her mom. 
Resurrection looks like doctors finally finding the problem and starting the journey to wellness. Resurrection looks like a 30-year marriage finding renewal. Resurrection looks like Arlington Life Shelter and Mission Arlington and Arlington Charities helping people get back on their feet. Resurrection looks like staring the world in the face and saying no. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to settle for violence and terror and injustice and oppression. That because of our risen Lord, we can strive for peace and justice and enough for all. Each morning, with the rising of the sun and in the light of the risen sun, we have the opportunity to encounter resurrection. Each new day is a chance to witness a miracle, to see the covenant fulfilled. Yet we have to be willing to step out in faith. Mary, Mary, and Salome were faithful even in death as they bought spices to anoint Jesus' body. They showed up even in the midst of their personal sorrow and grief. Even as Friday's crucifixion was weighing heavily on them, even though they thought all was lost, they showed up at the tomb. Even when our lives get hard, even when the storms seem without end, we show up here to be in a community of resurrection, to be surrounded by people who are hoping to see Jesus. I think of our pilgrimage and celebration attendees who faithfully attend usually not just one conference, but conference after conference, expecting God to show up and move in their midst. I think of our worship committee members and their helpers who work hard to make this space open to the moving of the Holy Spirit that we might see Jesus. I think of all the hands that contribute to our many missions, like those who will be traveling to Mississippi later this month to learn about providing sustainable, clean water by building relationships that they might see Jesus by giving the thirsty a drink. These are opportunities for resurrection and an opportunity to witness to our risen Lord. For the thing about being church is The thing about being witnesses is we are called to proclaim the good news even in Friday's shadow in the midst of an empty tomb. But we are not on our own. We have each other. And that's why we don't come to church hoping to find God within these four walls. Alice Walker in The Color Purple wrote, Have you ever found God in church? I never did. I just found a bunch of folks hoping for God to show. Any God I ever felt in church, I brought in with me. And I think that the other folks did too. They come to church to share God, not find God. We come to church this Easter Sunday 2,000 years later to witness to the risen Lord. Not that He is confined within these walls, but that through relationships, through being God's people together and inviting more people into our family, we will share the resurrection experience once more. And we will go and tell. One of my favorite theories about the abrupt ending of Mark's Gospel with the women who said nothing to anyone is that Mark is inviting you, the reader and the hearer, to step into the story. Mark invites you to be witnesses to the empty tomb. Mark invites you to spread the good news that a tomb cannot hold our God, that resurrection has triumphed over sin and death, that we are set free once more to be in covenant with God to be in relationship with our risen Lord, who Himself is the promise fulfilled.
Mark invites you and me to tell what we have seen, to witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection that we can experience today by the power of the Holy Spirit. God promised a covenant of survival and new life, of relationship, of grace, of shalom in the midst of brokenness, of a heart-written covenant, of a king and a lamb, of a new covenant at the table. Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified and laid in a tomb, fulfilled that covenant. God keeps God's promises, even to the point of death. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, see the promise of new life that God makes for you and you and you and me. For not even death can stop God's covenant. Not even a tomb can stop the love of Jesus Christ. The love between God and God's people. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and Amen.